Welcome to Faith Lutheran Online. There is nothing quite like being an eyewitness, giving a special perspective to share on the event. Peter writes about being on the Mount of Transfiguration, as he, James, and John were privileged to have a special vision of the Lord Jesus Christ. He states, We were witnesses of His majesty, for when He received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to Him by the majestic glory, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with Him on the holy mountain. Today, through the words of Scripture, we too become eyewitnesses and are given a glimpse of glory in the vision of our transfigured Lord. Well, good morning and welcome to Faith Lutheran Church on this very special day, this Sunday we call Transfiguration. And if you've been watching us for a while, you probably noticed that uh, we're a little bit more formal this morning um, as we record our service. It's uh, because uh, today is a, a special day, but the, the formality also reminds us that uh, the reason that uh, the pastor wears a robe is um, it represents Christ covering us with his righteousness. It also helps you focus on the word of God and not just on the pastor's tie or what he's wearing on any given day. And so um, uh, we, we hope that this, uh, this service will be a blessing to you. Uh, we also invite you, again, as we always do, to join us at 9.30 on Sunday mornings uh, where we uh, are meeting currently in our courtyard and um, with these opportunities for worship, we pray that you will continue to be blessed during this pandemic as we look forward to the day when we can gather again together face to face. But uh, for today, uh, welcome. We are glad that you're tuned in and we pray God blesses you as we worship together. So let us make our beginning this morning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The prophet Isaiah reminds us, For thus said the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, In returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. Therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you, and therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you. For the Lord is a God of justice, and blessed are those who who wait for him. You shall have a song as in the night when a holy feast is kept and gladness of heart and when one sets out to the sound of the flute to go to the mountain of the Lord to the rock of Israel. I invite you now to join us for the singing together of our opening song.
As we come into the presence of God, it is always important and good for us to confess our sins to receive his word of assurance and forgiveness. O God, our Father, we admit and confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean and that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We confess that we have not always brought glory to you through our words and our deeds. We repent of all that is sinful in our lives, both that which we know and those things unknown to us that are against your righteous laws. And so as you think upon those words, and if that indeed is your confession, by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I, as a called and ordained servant of Christ, Forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ who calls you, he who calls you is faithful and he will surely do it. Amen. Let us pray. O God, in the glorious transfiguration of your beloved Son, you confirmed the mysteries of the faith by the testimony of Moses and Elijah. In the voice that came from the bright cloud, you wonderfully foreshadowed our adoption by grace. Mercifully make us co-heirs with the King in his glory, and bring us to the fullness of our inheritance in heaven. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. On February 14th, we commemorate Valentine, m martyr. The word martyr reminds us that Valentine died for confessing his faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. For 1800 years, Valentine's faithful witness has inspired Christian people to faith-filled words and loving deeds. A physician and priest in Rome during the rule of Emperor Claudius Valentine lived in a time when Christians were harshly persecuted because of their religion. Arrested by Roman authorities, he received a death sentence. Tradition suggests that while Valentine was waiting in jail for his day of execution, he developed a friendship with the young daughter of his jailer. 
He told the girl about Jesus and shared his hope of heaven. On the day of his execution, he left her a note cut in a special shape. Written inside the message of affection and encouragement, he signed the letter, Your Valentine, beginning a tradition that has changed and grown through the centuries. Love for Christ and love in Christ shape the actions of Valentine. On Valentine's Day, it is good to reflect on what that love is like. In the hymn, Love in Christ is Strong and Living, poet Dorothy R. Schultz helps our reflection with three beautiful stanzas set to the music by her husband, Ralph C. Schultz. Together, we sing the hymn. Let us pray. Lord of love, bless our remembering of the saints of ages past, including your servant Valentine. Help us proclaim your love in our day, in a world, in a word and deed, as we look forward to the great reunion with all of the saints in your heavenly kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 34, verses 29 to 35. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the covenant law in his hands, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, so Aaron and all the leaders of the community came back to him, and he spoke to them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near him, and he gave them all of the commands the Lord had given him on Mount Sinai. When Moses finished speaking to them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever he entered the Lord's presence to speak with him, he removed the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what had been commanded, they saw that his face was radiant. Then Moses would put the veil back over his face until he went in to speak with the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. The New Testament reading comes from the book of 2 Corinthians. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what has passing away. But their minds were made dull. For to this day the same veil remains when the Old Covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, 
who have unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. The God of this age has blinded minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ ours as Lord, and ourselves as servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the faces of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. The Holy Gospel today from the Gospel of Mark, uh, reading from the ninth chapter, beginning at the second verse. Glory, Glory to you, you O Lord. Lord. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for he was terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. 
as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Transfiguration of Jesus is certainly about glory. But Jesus himself tells us, and this entire text shows us, that it's not glory only. That suffering now comes with glory. As a matter of fact, the story of salvation, how God saves us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, is a story about Jesus always retaining his divinity, his glory, but one in which he suffers, and quite a bit, before he is fully glorified. And it's the same with us today. Now we experience some of the glory of being saved through Jesus Christ. But now we don't experience the glory of perfection, the perfect and complete glory that we can only experience when we get to heaven. Uh, some people have explained the life of a Christian as one of theological tension. There's a tension between the fact that we now have glory, but not yet complete glory. As a matter of fact, St. Paul in the first, book, first chapter of Ephesians says to us that we have every spiritual blessing now in Christ Jesus. But we don't experience the fullness of these blessings now. It's only when we get to heaven that we experience them fully. We are adopted. We are saved. We are sanctified. But we don't experience it yet in perfection or completion. See, our glorious uh, salvation will not be made fully glorious until we reach heaven or until Christ comes back again on the clouds of heaven. 
So let's look at this transfiguration event that Mark records for us to see how we know that we have God's glory now, but not yet perfect glory. I want you to start by the immediate preceding context of Mark chapter 8. If you have your Bibles, please open them up. Uh, follow along, please, and uh, maybe it's a Bible app. Pull it out. Mark chapter 8, starting at verse 27. This is what is said right there. And Jesus went with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist, and others say, Elijah, and others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered him, You are the Christ. And he strictly charged them not to tell anyone about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and to be killed, and after three days rise again. So you see, immediately before the transfiguration of Jesus, he is teaching them about suffering. <laughs> he is teaching them that he must suffer. And you may remember that right after that, Peter comes to Jesus and says, I'm not going to let anyone cause you to suffer. No way. And what does Jesus tell him? This is what it says. It starts in verse 33 of that same chapter. Get behind me, Satan. For you are not said, setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. You see, it was necessary for Jesus Christ himself to suffer in our place so that we might be saved. And then the verses of 34 and following in that same chapter, right? They say that Jesus tells his disciples that they will also suffer and they must bear their cross to follow him. Hmm. Now I want to make the suggestion that Jesus is the very best pastor in the whole world that ever existed. <laughs> And he is a good pastor here because he first tells them the truth. The truth that suffering should be expected in this life and that an especially harrowing suffering is to come in Jesus' own life, in the crucifixion. And this is not the only place that Jesus tells his disciples or us this. Remember in the Sermon on the Mount, it says this in Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all thing, kinds of evil things against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. In other places, the Bible promises that Christians will suffer. Christians will be persecuted. The first followers of Jesus, they consistently experienced persecution and suffering wherever they were. You may remember Paul suffering greatly and being imprisoned and falsely accused of so many things. And Paul in 2 Timothy says that, we should, that everyone who is a Christian should expect suffering in this life. So suffering comes for the Christian before glory is perfected. But I want to make the suggestion that with God, we can also overcome and live through suffering. And this gets to the point of the transfiguration itself. You see, I believe Jesus, out of pastoral love for his disciples then and for us here today. That's why he was transfigured. He loved them so much. Remember, he's the greatest pastor that ever lived. And what do I mean by that? This discussion of Jesus needing to suffer and die, and them also needing to suffer and bear their crosses, this must have been wearing on the disciples. They must have been weary, maybe even already experiencing some of this suffering. And Jesus knew that the worst was yet to come. So, 
he told them the truth that a Christian and a Christian's life includes suffering. But he didn't want to leave it there when they were weary of this subject. Look at what happens. Starting at verse 2 of chapter 9. Please follow along. And after six days, that is six days after teaching them all of this about suffering, Jesus took, him, took with him Peter, James, and John and led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. So first, this is not a natural phenomenon. This is rather a supernatural phenomenon. No human, no one on earth could make this happen. We see here, in the human nature of Christ, and even in his own clothing, the divine nature of Christ and its brilliance shining. The brilliance of Jesus Christ shining through his clothes. Maybe even the very same clothes that were soiled and bloodied at the crucifixion. Ha! This is amazing. Jesus here wants to make sure that even though he is talking about the need for suffering in his life and the fact that Christians will suffer in their lives, he is the Son of God. He is glorious. He still has his divine nature and ability to save. By the way, other accounts of this transfiguration also tell us that Jesus' face was transfigured and was radiating light. So, let's continue with verse 4. And there appeared with him Moses, Moses and Elijah, and they were talking with Jesus. <laughs> These are two of the most famous believers of the Old Testament. Moses, you will recall, is a prototype of Jesus, who delivered the people of Israel out of the house of slavery, out of Egypt, and delivered them through the Red Sea and, and, and led them through the wilderness. You may remember Moses also was the one who received the law of God on Mount Sinai. And he met with God many times in the tabernacle. And every time he met with God, you may remember that his face radiated reflected the light of God back to the people. Hmm, kind of like this transfiguration. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, in those days, people were afraid to see Moses after he met with God. So he often wore a veil. Hmm. And Elijah was one of the bravest and most bold of prophets in the Old Testament. He took on evil kings and queens and all these false prophets. You may remember how he famously asked God to rain down fire from heaven upon his drenched sacrifice to show who the real God is. <laughs> and God not only rained down fire and consumed that sacrifice for Elijah, but it also burned to a crisp all of those false prophets. Hmm. So this is pretty cool <laughs> to have Moses and Elijah with Jesus. And this is why we get to verse 5, where Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Kind of like the Old Testament people when they just saw a reflection, a glimpse of the living God. Hmm. That's what they see in Jesus here, a glimpse of who he really is, the living God. But it turns out that humans like glory. <laughs> Peter personifies this for us as a representative of all of us. Yeah, it's pretty cool to be here with Moses and Elijah and with Jesus in glory. I mean, when I get to heaven, I'm going to want to do some of this kind of stuff. <laughs> talk to Moses, talk to Elijah. Hmm. Yeah, we do love glory. As a matter of fact, evidence of this is given by a very few 
successful television and radio evangelists who have become very popular preaching what is called a theology of glory. Now there is a proper theology of glory that we can understand is that we receive the glory of God through salvation in Jesus Christ. But the theology of glory that some of these preachers teach is one that suggests when you become a Christian, suffering will end. When you become a Christian, your ailments will end. When you become a Christian, everything is going to be better in your earthly life. Your stress is gone, your worries are gone, your sadness is gone, your loneliness is gone, whatever it is that ails you, it'll go away when you're a Christian. And this is not true. That's not what Jesus tells his disciples here before this transfiguration. It's not what Jesus tells us elsewhere in scripture, as we heard earlier. <laughs> and yet, some of Jesus' glory lives in us. We do have, with the power of the Holy Spirit, some glory of Jesus, the forgiveness of sins, the ability to love and serve another person, like Jesus did. And the fact that we have some glory now makes our lives better. This is the way it is for a Christian. We have suffering and glory. <laughs> and then that glory is perfected when we die or when Jesus comes back on the clouds of heaven. Now, we read in seven, verse 7 and following, and a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out from the cloud, this is my beloved son, listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they saw, no longer saw anyone with them, but Jesus only. The fact that God the Father audibly speaks should be recognized by most of us as also occurring at Jesus' baptism. And in this particular time, he identifies who Jesus is, the Son of God, the beloved Son of God, just like he did at the baptism. But this time he adds, listen to him. Well, what is Jesus teaching? Well, we just saw that Jesus was teaching about the fact that he was going to suffer and die and rise again to save us. This is the main message that we should listen to. And we should also understand that suffering will come to us even though we are Christians. And maybe even more so because we are Christians. Notice that uh, what happens next. Okay. What happens next in verses 9 and 10? And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they might keep the matter, so they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. Hmm. So you can see at this time, the disciples are confused about why Jesus must die, why he must suffer and also a little bit confused about the resurrection. It's not that they don't believe in the resurrection like some teachers at that time believed, the Sadducees in particular. They just are perplexed by this mystery of the Son of God, because they know who he is, Jesus, needing to suffer and die and to be raised again. But notice that they obey Jesus' command to not tell anyone until after he is raised from the dead. As a matter of fact, not immediately after he is raised from the dead do they do this. But certainly, after the Holy Spirit comes on Pentecost, they tell everyone. That's when they become bold witnesses for Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, this is recorded for us in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 19. Listen to this. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard it. <laughs> 
we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven for we were with him on the holy mountain and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining on a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts <laughs> wow what a testimony they could now give both about the suffering and death and resurrection of Jesus and the fact of who he is, God, because of this transfiguration. And this is good for us to know about. The fact that Jesus is the ruler of all, the God of creation, the God who sustains the universe, the God who can save us as we go into Lent. Because Lent is also a time when we, com when we contemplate our sin and our sinfulness and the suffering that results. And you know this from your own life experiences. Some of you have had a lot of suffering in your lives. Sometimes there is intense suffering that we think most humans could not bear. For example, in the loss of a child or the loss of a spouse, the loss of a relationship. Others suffer with mental illnesses, with anxiety, with depression, with addiction to all sorts of things. And some of this comes from our own sin and sinfulness. But other things just happen in this life because of the sin in the world. Because the devil and his demons are after us. And this suffering is indeed real. But the transfiguration of Jesus Christ should convince you that with Jesus, overcoming through the suffering and overcoming in suffering is possible. Everything is better with the perfect pastor, Jesus Christ. He doesn't promise that all of this suffering will end. He doesn't promise a miracle. He doesn't promise that he will relieve you of whatever ails you. But he does promise that he loves you, that he cares for you, that he wants you to win through the suffering. And he promises you the complete and perfect glory of salvation in heaven. And even in this life, Jesus does bring relief and joy and power to overcome in some of the worst of our suffering circumstances. Jesus gives you his glory, his joy, his peace when a mourner has a fellow congregant come and listen and pray and visit. It's the power and the glory of Jesus that meets you in the hospital when someone prays over you. It's the power and glory of Jesus that gives you a helping hand, that helps you out physically, that helps you emotionally. That comes to you when you are sick or injured or need help. And God, who has given you faith, is most certainly living inside of you with some glory that is in your heart now. Glory that is the glory of Jesus Christ himself, revealed in part on Transfiguration Day. We got a glimpse of what God can do. We got a glimpse of what God is doing inside of our hearts. So, let that glory of God out. Let your light shine. Let the glory of God reach out to all those you come into contact with. Love them, serve them, like our loving pastor Jesus has loved and served us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. This morning we're going to focus on a teaching from our catechism. In the first article, our confession is focused on God our Creator, from whom our divine Savior Jesus Christ has proceeded. 
It is the voice of God the Father that we hear on the mountain of transfiguration, acclaiming his son Jesus and directing his disciples to listen to him. As we declare our faith in God the Father, we affirm our trust in his plan for us as his children to grant us life and to place us into vocations through which we can serve him and our neighbors. We speak the words of this article of the Apostles' Creed, followed by the explanation written by Dr. Martin Luther. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. What does this mean? I believe that God has made me and all creatures, that he has given me my body and soul, eyes and ears and all my members, my reason and all my senses, and still takes care of them. He also gives me clothing and shoes, food and drink, house and home, spouse and children, land, animals, and all that I have. He richly and daily provides me with all that I need to support this body and life. He defends me against all danger, guards and protects me from all evil. All this he does only out of fatherly divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness in me. For all this, it is my duty to thank and praise, serve and obey him. This is most certainly true. Let us take some moments now um, as we come before uh, God's throne of grace in prayer. And this morning I invite you to participate at home with, with me is that when I conclude a petition, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and you respond, hear our prayer. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus revealed his light and glory to Peter, James, and John. Embolden us to proclaim Christ's light and glory to the ends of the earth. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, Peter, James, and John heard your voice on the mountaintop. Help us to heed your voice and your word that comes to us in the scriptures. Strengthen us to listen to your voice rather than the voice of the world. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, comfort all those who are suffering in grief. Console them with the hope of the resurrection to eternal peace and life. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, Peter reminds us that no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but all prophets are carried along by the Holy Spirit. Send your spirit to call gather, enlighten, sanctify, and keep your people. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, you have shined the light of Christ on this world. Help us reflect your light to those who are experiencing the darkness of the world. Bring community to the lonely, stability to those in transition, and safety to all those who have suffered abuse. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, look with favor upon all who are sick, injured, and recovering. Especially, we continue to remember um, our preschool director, Callie. Um, we uh, name others in our heart. We pray for Arlene Grave, recovering from uh, a broken bones. Um, we continue to pray for all of our members that you would protect them from COVID, um, that would you continue to watch over and keep us safe. Lord, we ask that you have mercy upon all those that we name before you today, that you heal them according to your good and gracious will. 
Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we commend all these things to your infinite mercies, which are new every morning. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Now in the words of our Lord, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This coming week, with Ash Wednesday, we begin our observance of Lent. To highlight the penitential nature of this season, it is the church's custom to suspend the use of the word Alleluia, which means praise the Lord. A tradition has been in place since the fifth century not to use the joyful word Alleluia in worship from the conclusion of worship on the final Sunday before Lent, which is today, until the first service on Easter Sunday morning. The text of our closing hymn, Alleluia, Song of Gladness, dates back to the 11th century and links us to a millennium of God's people at worship. We now repeat words from the book of Ecclesiastes, which remind us that there are appropriate times for all things, including a time to keep silence, which we will observe regarding the use of the Alleluia throughout Lent. For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. And so as part of our observance of a Holy Lent, as it begins this week, we now say farewell to Alleluia until the time of our rejoicing anew at the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ on Easter Day. Alleluia. Amen. And now finally, the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen.